Hardspace Shipbreaker combines three of my favorite things, a relatively grounded sci-fi world, an engrossing and relaxing gameplay loop, and safely handling nuclear materials. Hardspace Shipbreaker is set in a future where humanity has recently spread out and industrialized most of the solar system with the help of a Mass Effect-esque railgate system built by the obviously evil megacorporation Amazon. Oops, that's a typo, let me see here. The obviously evil megacorporation Lynx. You play as a nobody from Earth, which at this point in the future is essentially Detroit. Everyone wants to leave this shithole. At the beginning of the game, you get accepted into the Lynx salvage division and are quickly shipped off planet to work in the orbital shipbreaking yards. Once there, you have your DNA taken, your original body destroyed, and then you're loaded into a fresh clone and then saddled with a fuck ton of debt for the whole process. My fellow gamers, I feel like there's a lesson to be learned here, but I don't know what it is. Now saddled with the debt equivalent of one American University student, you're set to begin working it off in the yard as a shipbreaker or cutter. Luckily, you won't be short on work as humanity's rapid expansion into the solar system means there are a lot of ships that need to be scrapped. Each ship is worth a certain amount based on all the materials and objects in it, and the basic objective is to reclaim as much of the total value from a ship as possible. At the end of a shift, you get compensated for everything you correctly salvage, minus daily fees, interest, charges for this girl's OnlyFans, and for your equipment. The basic way you take ships apart is by destroying cut points, which will freeze certain panels and walls away from the body of the ship. These are usually a good place to start, but many ships will require you to make your own cuts in order to free certain components. Everything is destructible, and the system the devs designed to handle this is pretty impressive. Every piece of the ship can be sliced or destroyed with one tool or another. Explosions show off this system the best though. The way that the parts of the ship fracture into different sized pieces is really neat, and even though I've never blown up a spaceship before, it somehow feels authentic. But you know what else is authentic? The fact that 98% of you aren't subscribed. I'm trying to hit a thousand subs before the end of the year, so if you want to see more content like this, sub and or like the video. I really appreciate all your support, these videos take a ton of work. Ahem. Segway. Shipbreakers have four main tools in their arsenal, the helmet scanner, the grapple, the laser cutter, and demo charges. The cross-spectrum scanner essentially lets you x-ray vision to see through the ship and plan how you want to approach it. It easily identifies cut points, material types, and which areas are pressurized or not. Later on, you get upgrades and different modes that allow you to see different systems, but I really found the main mode the most useful. The grapple lets you move objects around or force push them while also allowing you to tether items to each other or other surfaces. Tethers will always pull things towards each other, so they're incredibly useful for moving objects or quickly sending things into their intended bays. They can even be preset so that as soon as you detach an object, it will fly right off. Very handy when working on something time sensitive like a reactor or engine block. You can also reel in the grapple line when grappling an object. This pulls light objects to you, allowing for more controlled handling of salvage, but it also pulls you to heavy objects, allowing you to use it to slingshot yourself around the bay. As this counts as a grappling hook by the universal laws of gaming, this means that this game is automatically a 10 out of 10, as it's widely known and accepted that any game with a grappling hook is instantly made 3.5 times more fun. Now, despite revealing my totally serious score for this game so soon, let us continue the review for the sake of my watch time. The laser cutter is your second main tool and has two modes. The first is a precision beam, which can melt down small structural pieces and cut points. While being more precise, it requires you to hold the beam on the target for longer, and you have to manage a heat mechanic. The other mode slices wide along a displayed line. It's great for cutting entrances, shearing off bits that aren't connected to a cut point, or cutting off necromorph limbs. One example would be these air filters which are embedded right into the walls. It's also one of the faster ways to destroy cut points as it takes less time and doesn't build heat like the precision laser. However, this mode is most likely to cause catastrophic damage as it can penetrate through lighter materials and even slice things behind them as well sometimes. I've also had some issues with the beam appearing to slice off the line, but this is just a visual bug. It actually does always cut on the displayed line, 
but this definitely does make your nuts shrivel the first few times it happens near something explosive. Lastly, the demo charges are unlocked later in the story and are pretty simple to use. Place or throw them down on a surface, and when the trigger is pulled, they'll slice through anything in the holographic plane. Terrorists win. They are mainly used to cut stuff your laser isn't powerful enough to, like the outer hull of a ship or certain types of cut points. It also looks really sick when you place a bunch of them and set them off, since they go sequentially in the order that you place them rather than all at once, and it just has this really cool sound effect as well. Once ripped from the ship, objects need to be shoved into the furnace, processor, or barge in order to get credit for them. The furnace and processor are for different types of metals that presumably are just melted down and recycled for use in other ships, while the barge is for more complex items like chairs, computers, or reactors that we can assume just get slapped into other ships rather than being recycled. Luckily, you don't need to memorize what goes where, as your HUD will tell you where something needs to go just by looking at it. While on your shift, you'll have to manage your oxygen and thruster fuel, and while these can sometimes be salvaged from ships, more often than not you'll have to buy them from the company kiosk at the Master Jack. Yeah, Lynx is so cheap they won't even give you air without trying to fleece you. Hello, I like money. Likewise, if you manage to ironically crack your helmet with a suit patch kit, you'll need to go buy one to fix up the hole. You'll also need to buy health kits to top yourself up if you fall victim to one of the many hazards you'll encounter while breaking ships. There are many ways to get hurt or even die in Shipbreaker. Suffocation, fire, freezing, you can even accidentally fall into the processor and get recycled. But most of my deaths were caused by... <clears throat> rapid unplanned disassembly of the ship I was working on. Now, remember at the beginning when I said you were cloned? Well, Hard Space is one of those great games that has an in-lore explanation for respawning. When you die, Lynx simply clones another one of you, implants your memories into it, and shoves you right back into the yard. Oh yeah, and you get another bill for good measure. In standard mode, you have 15 minutes per shift to work, after which you get booted back into the HAB, which is where you select your missions and upgrade or repair your gear in between shifts. Don't worry though, as you can continue working from exactly where you left off as soon as you start your next shift. But if you don't like the idea of the shift timer, you can remove it by starting your save in open shift mode, which disables the shift timer and also lets you disable oxygen drain. Keep in mind though that you can't switch between these modes with the same save, each mode on the menu here counts as an individual save slot. Touching on the other two modes really quick here, they're pretty self-explanatory. No revival means you only have one life. It's an Iron Man mode. When you die, all progress is lost. Limited is the same concept, except you're given 30 lives. Both modes function the exact same in gameplay as standard, except for the respawning mechanics. Free play is basically a creative mode, there's no oxygen or fuel drain, no time limit, and you get a thousand tethers and unlimited demo charges. Free play is a cool mode for quickly practicing with the ship or figuring out how something works. Damn it, I just realized I just went on a massive tangent. Anyway, after every shift you get a little breakdown of how much you earned and how much Lynx is taking back in fees. All I got is this 20 for the rest of the week. <sighs> Sorry, doesn't pay the rent. While the constant fees do thematically work with the game's themes of corporate exploitation, it actually doesn't affect your gameplay. You can't run out of money because you're in debt anyway, and even then, the fuel and oxygen costs, even the cost of the tethers and demo charges, are really nothing compared to the amount you'll be extracting from a ship. Unless you die way too much or barely salvage anything, you'll be making way more per shift than what you're charged at the end of it. And this is great, because it means that while failure is spectacular, the only real punishment for it is losing some time if you want to restart a ship. The real progression gameplay-wise doesn't start from paying off your debt, but rather increasing your certification rank and upgrading your gear. Certification rank is essentially your level, and you increase it by collecting mastery points. You get these by earning credits through collecting salvage, and the amount you earn is a function of the hazard rank and the total value of the ship you're working on. To put it simply, the bigger and more hazardous jobs you do, the faster you level up. Increasing your cert rank unlocks new and more complex ships to work on, as well as upgrades for your gear. These upgrades can be unlocked between shifts in the HAB using link tokens, which are earned by completing a ship's salvage goals. These are basically predetermined points where you get rewarded for not screwing things up. It's pretty easy to hit the highest target unless you destroy something important like the ship's reactor. It's really these two mechanics that you should be focusing on as a measure of progress rather than overcoming your debt. 
I don't have too much to say about the upgrades themselves, besides some late game spoiler related ones, they are mainly just standard increases to your gear stats, like being able to carry more demo charges or tethers, slower heat buildup on your laser, more oxygen or fuel capacity, you get the point. I think it would have been cool if you could unlock some more modes for your tools or significantly upgrade how they function. At its core, Shipbreaker is a puzzle game. Each ship is its own little puzzle, and in order to solve it quickly, efficiently, and damaging as little valuable material as possible, you're going to need to carefully plan your actions. At times, it can be tense, as a single mistake can set off a chain reaction that destroys half the ship you're working on. I really like how the designs of the ship match their purpose, like the industrial look of the haulers, a mess of support beams and struts with the cargo strapped to the outside, exposed to space, the station shuttles with airplane-like interiors for shuttling passengers, the science ships with tons of sensor equipment and space for labs in the interior. The sense that these ships were lived in and actually used really strengthens my sense of immersion, and at times, entering an abandoned ship is extremely atmospheric, like you're entering a tomb. You could almost expect a xenomorph to come barreling down a hallway. Hard Space Shipbreaker also features a limited type of procedural generation, where each ship is generated off of a template which can produce minor variations in each ship. This somewhat helps to prevent things from coming repetitive, with each ship being the exact same as the last one of that type that you did. The process of crawling, or I guess floating through the guts of each ship, figuring out what connects to what, and discovering the quirks of each design is really satisfying. You have complete freedom to approach the ships however you want, and it feels great to figure out a new way to do something. Like when I was taking apart this passenger liner, I realized that instead of taking all this stuff in the cabin out through a side entrance, it would be much easier to just cut my own hole in the floor and throw everything through it into the barge. As you progress in the game, you unlock bigger, more complicated, and more dangerous ships. New hazards are added, like giant tanks of fuel, electrical systems, or barrels of coolant. The systems of the ships also get more complicated, often requiring multiple steps in order to properly extract them. For example, if you remove the power systems before depressurizing a ship, you won't be able to use the atmosphere regulators, or airlocks won't work, so you'll have to do a violent decompression to get all the air out. I found that Shipbreaker paces these increases in difficulty really well. I never felt like I was given a task that I couldn't eventually handle with enough thinking or practice, even if there were some minor accidents figuring it out. An increase in difficulty is always accompanied by a new piece of gear, if not even an outright tutorial level tied into the story to teach you how to handle it. Speaking of the story, it's pretty basic, but it gets the job done. Your character is basically a silent protagonist built for you to live vicariously through you have no influence on the story at all. There are no choices, you just hit certain milestones and the story automatically progresses. There are only like three cutscenes throughout the entire game, and besides that, the story is entirely told through characters speaking over the radio to you in your hab or while you're out working. Now I'm briefly going to go over the plot points at a high level, so if you want to avoid spoilers, skip to the timestamp on screen for my general thoughts, but honestly, I don't think this is a masterpiece you should be worried about getting spoiled on. So the beginning of the game is really just getting to know the characters in your Shipbreaker group as you learn the basics. You have Weaver, the calm and composed, friendly southerner that is the team's foreman and the player's mentor figure throughout the game. Lou, an idealistic Shipbreaker that has a history opposing authority. Dee Dee, a no-nonsense cutter working to send money back to her family on Mars. And finally Kaido a good-natured but clumsy young shipbreaker trying to raise money to pay for medical treatments for his sister. Weaver walks you through the basics of shipbreaking, and slowly you start to get your legs. At one point, you get an email from Lou inviting you into an underground union email group, you learn more about the world and the characters, but nothing major happens for a while. Eventually, however, Lynx finds out about the union underground, and in an effort to stop it, sends out administrators to each of the shipbreaker groups. Your group is assigned the Troglodyte. 
Your group is assigned the absolute troglodyte Hal Rhodes, who just cares about increasing profits and doesn't really get anything about the job, despite trying to assert his dominance. He continuously angers the team by forcing them to work more hazardous jobs, which provides the story justification for the ships getting more complicated and dangerous. Eventually, Hal intercepts an email between Lou and the Union where she's complaining about him, and she's also suggesting to destroy Link's property to protest worker rights. He immediately fires her and cuts her off from communicating with the rest of the team. Upon learning that the Union was considering sabotage, Link's activates Clause 19C. Now, what is 19C, you may be asking? Remember that contract I mentioned at the beginning of the video? Well, perhaps we should have read the fine print, because as clones created using Link's equipment, this clause claims that we are technically their property. By bringing this clause into effect, you and your cutters are essentially enslaved, having your freedom massively restricted and giving middle managers like Hal tyrannical power. Wow, this really says a lot about society. Tension continues to escalate throughout the team as Hal steadily increases his dickishness, muting and overruling Weaver continuously, berating Kaido, and even going so far as to prevent Dee Dee from sending money to her family. When things are at their worst, Lou manages to sneak an email to the team suggesting that they protest the new rules by destroying ships rather than salvaging them. The team agrees, and as you head into the yard for the final story mission, your goal is to cause as much destruction as possible. Throw things into the wrong processors, melt down the reactors, slice up electronics, as much as possible to fail all the salvage goals. While you're doing this, Hal has a meltdown in disbelief that his minions are revolting. Throughout this mission, not only does he say a lot of legally dubious things over the radio, He also fucks around with your thruster control, making you periodically unable to move. Eventually, like the absolute baboon he is, he deletes Kaido's genetic information while he's handling a nuclear reactor. Meaning, if he gets killed, he's dead for real. They do a little psych out, making you think that Kaido dies, and everyone gets very sad, but then it turns out he's alright. Kinda pussied out, not gonna lie, you should've kept him dead for more stakes. Come on guys, commit to the bit, don't cop out like that. It's not like anybody really cares about Kaido. Meanwhile, it turns out the whole shift was recorded and then posted online. Apparently the Space UN had no idea that thousands or maybe even millions of people had been enslaved before the recording got leaked. Because of this, Lynx gets cancelled and the Space UN forces them to give the Cutters their rights back. It also forces them to negotiate with the Union and everyone gets their debts cleared and lives happily ever after. If that sounds pretty abrupt, it's because it is, frankly. All the conflict is essentially resolved in one cutscene, and it honestly feels pretty odd. It feels like this should have been spread out over a few more missions. There is an epilogue that you can unlock by completing some of the side content. Near the beginning of the game, Weaver gives you a ship, and you can fix it up by collecting parts while out salvaging. Once you complete the ship and clear your debt with Lynx, you can end your contract and GTFO to the outer planets, probably to immediately get captured by space pirates or something, knowing our luck. But there isn't much more to it than that, and you can still play in your career save after this. Your hab just loads up another clone of you to keep on ship breaking. While the story isn't bad, some part of me wonders if including the story was even necessary at all. I didn't really find the game to be very narrative driven, I was mainly playing because I thought the gameplay was fun. It may have been better for them to focus more resources on making more ship designs, adding in more features and types of hazards, rather than story. That being said, the voice acting is really good, and the voice actors clearly put their hearts into this. Each character's personality really comes through clearly, simply in the way they talk. You don't even need to see more than their character sprite in the bottom to understand who they are. Personally, I didn't really mind the basic story and rushed ending, because unless a game's explicitly story driven, I tend to care more about the gameplay. I am also a big world building guy, and I will say that the world building in this game is pretty damn good. The country music combined with the aesthetics of the ships, computers, the hab, the, the background of space with the giant rail gate and ships flying around, as well as the little bits of lore I picked up through the collectibles, really created this cowboy bebop space western type of atmosphere. I appreciate the effort put into the little tidbits of lore that you can find while exploring the ships, like audio logs left by rogue AI, or reading about how some rich Martian guy imported earth cows just so he could make ice cream on Mars. When it comes to bugs or performance, I didn't have many problems with the game. 
Despite my CPU being below the minimum specs, the game ran smooth as butter 98.5% of the time. As you might have noticed, the only times where the game struggles for me are during big explosions. My CPU probably doesn't help, but a small sample of people I asked on the subreddit reported the same thing. I mean, it makes sense, there's a lot of physics calculations going on here. The game is deciding if things need to shear off, how they're going to shear, and when it does you suddenly have a ton more physics objects floating around. Overall, it's not too big a deal, it just means my footage isn't as nice. There was one bug I encountered that has apparently been in the game for years, and that is when flushing the fuel lines on a quasar thruster, you'll sometimes randomly, instantaneously be crushed by an invisible force as the thruster comes apart. And yes commenters, I know that holding on can help prevent it, but I've still been crushed after holding on, so it seems a bit hit or miss. Another annoying bug, or maybe rather just how the game handles connections between parts, is how panels will sometimes stay connected even after it looks like you've cleanly separated them from everything, and you need to melt down all the little structural poles connected to it to actually free it. This one was really annoying and kind of breaks the immersion that is maintained pretty steadily throughout the game. Also, while the variety of ships is good for a while, they do start to feel the same after some time, even with the limited procedural generation. It would be cool if there was some sort of Steam Workshop support to allow custom ships. Unfortunately, the devs haven't committed to any further development on the game so far, both because apparently it hasn't made much money yet, and because they, Blackbird Interactive, are also the same studio that is working on Homeworld 3, so presumably all hands are on deck for that right now. Despite some minor problems though, overall I'd say this is a great game with a simple but cool premise and a great gameplay loop. There's just something really enjoyable about taking apart these ships, shift by shift slowly going from a massive hulk to a skeleton stripped bear, finally ready to be all tossed in the recycler. It gives the same type of feeling as cleaning up a room in Viscera cleanup detail, the enjoyment of cleaning, of putting things in order. Once you get into the flow of it and understand the systems, it can be a really zen game that is great to play with shows, Twitch streams, or YouTube going on a second monitor. Learning how to optimize salvaging ships after you've learned the basics is rewarding, and like I said before, it feels really great to figure out another strategy to save time and effort. For example, about halfway through the game I figured out that you don't really need to cut every cut point. Your natural response to seeing these bright yellow objects that are obvious to cut is just to slash every single one you see. But as I played and became more familiar with the ships, I began to understand where I could be more strategic, making fewer cuts and tethering larger pieces off so I could spend more time elsewhere. It's those little micro learning moments that really give you a dopamine hit and keep the experience fresh for longer. The game even takes advantage of this with the Cutter's Race mode, a sort of speedrun mode where you have to accomplish certain objectives on top of taking a ship apart within a certain amount of time, giving you a score at the end and ranking you on a leaderboard against other players with the challenge being refreshed weekly. Now it does suffer from the ships being repetitive just like the standard modes, but the aspect of competing against other players does add another layer of excitement that can keep you coming back for a while, especially if you're a player that enjoys optimizing a run. If you like story based games or don't like work simulator type games like Euro Truck Simulator, I don't think this will be up your alley, but I can wholeheartedly recommend Hard Space Shipbreaker at full price for any fan of zen simulator type games. For a lover of science fiction and all things space like myself, this was a game I wanted but never knew I wanted before I heard of it. It's just such a cool concept for a game and I'm surprised it actually took this long for somebody to do something like this. Even with the somewhat limited ship variety, I got roughly 32 hours out of it, and I think it was well worth the value of $35. Definitely pick this one up if you're interested, especially if you can get it on sale. And if you enjoyed the video, if it helped you make up your mind for buying this game, it would mean a lot to me if you could like the video or even subscribe to the channel. This review took quite a lot of work, which is why it came out quite a bit off schedule. Anyway, thank you for watching, and I will see you guys on the next one.